a young girl's sudden death scooped in suspicion. There were statements made by the stepmother that said, we think her bones were deformed, and that's why she fell. Can Dr. Madeline Hinkes figure out if this child's death was an accident or something far worse? It's hard to be detached when the cases involve little kids. some secret. A dead body is somewhere in your heart. We didn't have any hopes of finding the body at that point. We didn't know uh, where to look. Can Dr. Dirkmat uncover a family's disturbing secret? A shovel had been taken to, to destroy some of the remains and the evidence. In his 15 years working the homicide beat, Detective Richard Rallou has closed his fair share of tough cases. In the summer of 2003, while going through his office's unsolved case files, he comes across one of the toughest cases he's faced so far. It was probably 40 to 50 pages. I gave a copy to my sergeant, Jim Ferguson. We both took it home, read it, you know, word for word and we realized we had documentation of a, a suspicious death. The death in question is that of a three-and-a-half-year-old girl named Dawn Cooper, who had died in 1972. Beautiful little girl, blonde hair. The 30-year-old police report tells a sad story. Shortly after Dawn is born, her parents file for divorce, and she goes on to live with her father, Ted Cooper. By all accounts, Dawn's a happy and healthy little girl until she turns two and her father remarries. The stepmother had two children, <laughs> one years old and four years old. Don was sort of the stepchild that never was invited into the family. Soon after Dawn moves in with her stepmother, relatives take note of a disturbing development, black and blue marks that seem to appear with increasing regularity on different parts of her body. Then one night, Dawn's father brings her to the emergency room. She was in comatose state. Her father claims that she simply fell and hit her head. He goes on to explain that Dawn suffers from a foot deformity, which can make it awkward for her to walk and maintain her balance. Six hours later, Dawn dies. A pathologist performs an autopsy, but is unable to determine a cause of death. So there was a lot of questions, not only from the investigators that handled this case, but there were questions in the medical community, too, that went unanswered. Authorities at the time are particularly suspicious about one very disturbing finding. The autopsy report documented 35 bruises from the bottom of Don's feet to the top of her head. But without a definitive cause of death, the investigation stalls, rereading the report 31 years later. Rulu and Ferguson begin to seriously doubt the parents' claim that Dawn's death was accidental. These injuries were unusual places, bottom of the feet, extremely difficult to bruise. Then they see the photo from the autopsy. And that photograph will never leave my memory. There's no doubt in your mind this child was beaten. And virtually no place on her body that he hasn't been injured. The number, the sizes, the locations of the injuries that were apparent in the photograph left me with no other conclusion, that this was an, a homicide, not an accidental death. Now convinced that Dawn was murdered, Detectives Rulu and Ferguson are determined to make sure that justice is finally served. She have a child that deserves to be my age right now, and she wasn't given that opportunity. It doesn't matter in my mind if it was last week's murder or 30 years. It's still a murder that, that can't go on un unanswered. I don't think there's anything that could even come close to 
to explain how I feel about what happened. But I can do one thing, I can try to seek justice. They convinced the county DA's office to reactivate the file. Jill DiCarlo, a local prosecutor famous for having tried several other child homicides, takes on Dawn's case. And both my boss and I looked at these photos and said, this isn't right here, this is not an unknown, something happened. And you close your office door, you look at the photos, you cry a little bit, and then you roll up your sleeve and say, I'm gonna do what I have to do to make sure that this baby's name is vindicated. DiCarlo and the investigators immediately set about building a case against their prime suspect, Dawn's stepmother. First, they confirmed that she and Dawn's natural father are both still alive, still married, and living in New Mexico. Next, DiCarlo must get ready to disprove the stepmother's likely defense. There were statements made by the stepmother at the time that said, well, Dawn fell a lot and she had to wear corrective shoes and she, we think her bones were deformed and that's why she fell. So I felt there was going to be an issue from the defense in the future that this child's gait was abnormal. Though DiCarlo and the investigators are confident that Dawn's death wasn't due to orthopedic problems that caused her to fall, they need evidence. It was part of the roadblock that we had to get past before we could truly put this in front of a jury. And there is only one way to obtain that hard evidence. I wanted Dawn's body to be exhumed so I could have her feet looked at, her skeletal, everything looked at, basically. A medical examiner is brought in to perform a second autopsy. But to examine Dawn's feet, DiCarlo calls on a specialist, forensic anthropologist Madeline Hinkes. Everybody deserves justice, if not the first time around, then the, the second time around. But it's important for the anthropologist, or any of the scientists, to do the job well, because that makes or breaks the case. In July of 2003, the investigators and forensic team removed Dawn's coffin from the above-ground mausoleum where it was placed 31 years earlier. It was very, very emotional. I was looking at pictures of this child, and all of a sudden, the name is on that marble stone, you know, on the brass plaque that really brought it home why we were doing this case. We were doing it for, for Dawn. Coming up, the coffin is opened and Dr. Hinkes has to make a painful choice in the name of justice. It didn't seem right to cut off her feet after all she'd been through, but it, it had to be done for scientific purposes. And later, painstakingly searching for any trace of burnt human remains, Dr. Dirkmat comes up empty-handed. We weren't finding anything but just little animal bones and stuff like that of field mice, chipmunks, whatever. But he isn't ready to give up yet when Skeleton Stories returns. In 2003, a tiny coffin has been pulled from its crypt after 31 years. Police believe that a three and a half year old child inside the coffin, Dawn Cooper, was beaten to death in 1972 by her stepmother. They are now counting on forensic anthropologist Madeline Hinkes to provide the evidence that will disprove the stepmother's claim that Dawn's death was accidental due to malformation of her feet. My job was to focus on the ankles and the feet to see if there were some difference between the feet, if there was some sort of pathology or anomaly that might have contributed to being more clumsy than the average three-year-old. Once the coffin is pulled from the crypt, it is taken to the county medical examiner's office to be opened. We didn't know what we were going to find. So to a certain extent, there's an anticipation. Are we going to have uh, evidence that we can obtain? because you don't know until you actually open the casket. And once the coffin was open, we were all very taken back and very startled about the, the pristine condition that, that Dawn was in. There was a mummified body of a, a small child, naturally mummified. Little dress, shoes and socks. 
It turns out that Dawn's body has been preserved by a combination of factors. Her coffin was not airtight and was placed in an above ground crypt. As a result, the dry southwestern air worked to preserve her body, not unlike a mummy in the desert. When I looked at her, I could still see that beautiful little child like I was looking at in the black and white photos. In, the, in her hands, in the casket, sort of tucked in under her arms was a, a plaque that had a little prayer on it by uh, Mary Baker Eddy. Um, and the prayer was about um, protecting little children, guiding their path to heaven. But most shocking of all is what they see on Dawn's mummified body. So you could take the original black and white photograph of Dawn on the coroner's table prior to autopsy and match them to the existing bruises on Dawn now, this and 30 years later. Because Dawn died before her dozens of bruises could heal, the tissue where she was bruised remained flooded with blood. As her tissue dried out in the crypt, this blood stained the skin and bone, leaving a permanent record of her short, sad life. I mean, you could still see impact sites on her skull. It was remarkable. It was chilling to see the solid evidence of the bruises that were there. I, I hadn't expected that staining would, would last so long. I think about it a lot. These injuries could never have happened from a fall. As one of those physicians stated, if she fell from a 40-foot tree and hit every single branch on the way down, she still wouldn't have enough injuries as to what she sustained. But while it's clear to the team that Dawn had been beaten, it is impossible to pinpoint which injuries caused her death and who was responsible. Hinkus's investigation is the linchpin. If she can prove that the parents lied to police about the fall, it will be just what Jill DiCarlo needs to file a homicide charge. The medical examiner's staff takes dozens of x-rays of the mummified child, documenting as much of the remaining injuries as possible. Then it's time for Madeline Hinkes to begin her critical analysis of Dawn's feet. But first she needs to prepare herself emotionally. It's hard to be detached when the cases involve little kids because there, there's no good reason that they should be at the medical examiner's office. So, and being a mother, I think, probably makes it more difficult. But um, part of being a good forensic scientist is not letting those emotions out at that point in time. Dr. Hinkus begins her examination by carefully comparing the right foot to the left. I was looking for any, anything out of the ordinary or any disparity between the, the two feet. And on x-ray, I couldn't see any difference. Externally, they look okay. You know, they're symmetric, everything seems to be where it should be. But I needed to look at the actual bones in order to tell for certain if there was anything wrong with them. To get a good look at the bones themselves, Dr. Hinkus must remove Dawn's feet and clean off all the remaining tissue. Oh, but it, it, just, it just didn't seem right to cut off her feet after all she'd been through. But it, it, you know, it had to be done for scientific purposes. But what will Dr. Hinkus learn? And will it be the hard evidence detectives and prosecutors to call her accounting on to finally bring this case to trial? Coming up, Madeline Hinkis hones in on the truth. It was chilling to see the, the solid evidence. And later, Dr. Dirk Matt pieces together clues, but will he be able to provide the answers investigators desperately need? It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle when you start out. When Skeleton Stories returns. Forensic anthropologist Madeline Hinkes is about to make a very intimate study of a pair of tiny feet. The feet belong to Don Cooper, a three and a half year old girl who died from head injuries in 1972. The explanation for all these injuries and the defense for all these injuries all these years had been Don was clumsy because she had orthopedic problems. But the more investigators probe into Don's last months, the more convinced they are that Dawn was murdered, beaten to death by her stepmother. One of the relatives spoke with stepmom at one time about disciplining children. 
stepmom told the relative that when Dawn wets her bed or urinates on herself, that her method of punishing her is to rub her face in it, which certainly explains a rather large hematoma on the forehead of Dawn at the time of her death. Now, three decades later, they hope Dr. Hinkis will find the evidence in Dawn's bones to lead to a courtroom and a charge of murder. Before Dr. Hinkis can closely examine Dawn's bones, she must clean the remaining tissue without disturbing any skeletal evidence. This process is called maceration. The way it's done is to put the, the body part in water with a little bit of mild detergent, not bleach or any of those things, because that damages the bone, and to heat it, uh, which is how I usually do it. In the case of, of Dawn's feet, I knew that the bones would be very fragile and the heat would probably do damage, so I just had to soak them. Bones macerated. A week later, the bones emerged fully cleaned, but no longer intact. The hard part is laying them out in their proper order. It takes a specialist with Hankus' experience in examining young bones to be able to lay them out in their proper order. That's because many of the bones in a child's feet look the same. Children's feet consist of bone and cartilage, which gradually harden and become more distinct as children grow. I maybe had an advantage in that because my dissertation research involved skeletal remains of 300 children from a, a prehistoric site. So I was pretty good at figuring out which of these little bone preforms was which. Another challenge Dr. Hinkes faces is trying to detect any deformities in these tiny bones. Looking for maybe evidence of fractures, evidence that the joints didn't function properly, or that there was maybe missing bones, or just something that was different and not, not normal. A successful prosecution of Dawn's case now hinges on what Dr. Hinkes can deduce from slivers of cartilage as tiny as a bird's. I don't see any obvious pathologies here. After a painstaking reconstruction and scrutinizing every facet of the bones and cartilage, Dr. Hinkes finally comes to an indisputable conclusion. So I don't see evidence to support the stepmother's claim that there was something wrong with her feet and that's why she fell a lot and got bruised all the time. Dr. Hinkes makes a report to the county district attorney's office. Based on the examination of the bones, there's no reason why she would not have been able to walk properly. We were elated because we knew we could finish this case. That made the case. We knew that we were there. Without her being able to examine her bones, that would have always been an unknown. And I don't think that would have been a good unknown for us to have and still go forward with the case. Crucial evidence for us. Coming up, a strange twist in the case of Don Cooper. I just hung up the phone with them and started shaking. We're both in complete shock. You're in disbelief. You're in disbelief. And later, can Dr. Dirkman find traces of a body, or did the murderers cover their tracks too well for justice to be served? We didn't have any hopes of finding the body that we didn't know of where to walk it. When Skeleton Stories returns. Three and a half year old Don Cooper is rushed to the hospital. Though her stepmother claimed Don had accidentally fallen due to her feet being malformed. Finally, 31 years later, Dr. Madeline Hinkes has determined there is nothing wrong with Don's feet. To build their case against the stepmother, police begin talking to Dawn's extended family. They soon realize that Dawn's family members are just as eager to see that justice is finally served. And the family, when we contacted them and said, we are reopening this case, a murder did happen. So many of them, 99% of them, were extremely happy and jumping for joy that we were going to do something, that finally Dawn's killer was going to be brought to justice. Drawing on statements from relatives, 
Dawn's original case file, and now Dr. Hinkes' discovery that her feet were normal, police can finally assemble their version of Dawn's heartbreaking death. In June 1970, Dawn's stepmother moves in and immediately begins subjecting her to ferocious discipline. I hate you! You have ruined my life! Including repeated blows and beatings, especially to the face and head. The injuries are evident on the original autopsy photograph and verified by the new autopsy conducted on Dawn's exhumed body. She wanted to get that evil stepchild out of the way. Unfortunately, our story didn't have the Cinderella ending. By January 1972, the daily battering is taking its toll. Dawn's nervous system is rushing fluids to the sections of her brain bruised by the repeated blows to her skull. Her brain begins to swell. This swelling, called a cerebral edema, is especially dangerous because the brain, trapped in the hard casing of the skull, has almost no room to expand. As her swollen brain begins pressing against the inside of her own head, Dawn slips into unconsciousness and collapses. And yet, even then, the abuse isn't over. Our belief is, during that time, the stepmother would go in and check on her, and most likely, based on some of the bruises we saw in the, the pre-autopsy photographs, our belief is that she was probably kicking her with her foot to see if she'd move. But little Dawn can't move. Her father takes her to the hospital, but it is far too late. She dies at 8 a.m. the next morning, just 42 months and four days after she'd been born. It's horrific. As a mother, it makes you just your t stomach turn inside out that anybody, regardless of whether it's your own child or not, that anybody could hurt a child who is so helpless and, and, and defenseless. And it's just, it makes you, it really makes you sick. With the tragic picture finally clear, detectives fly to New Mexico to gather additional information. Their first order of business is to interview Dawn's stepmother. Then, they track down Dawn's father at work and go over his story of Dawn's last day. We met at a gas station around the corner from his work. Uh, we piled into my car and had an interview with him. That poor little girl. He never referred to his daughter as anything other than that little girl. Stares at his hands, will not look at you at ever. It's too bad what happened, but it, it wasn't anybody's fault. But my wife's a good woman and she wouldn't do anything. Didn't like answer that. questions yeah, directly, but there was a very uh, scripted feel to it. You'd ask a question, what happened to your daughter? Oh, uh, my wife's a good, a good housekeeper. She's a wonderful woman. He was very was great ho homemaker. adamant explaining to us that his wife was a great mother and that would never do anything to any child. What happened to your daughter? She had a convulsion or something, I don't know. Though Dawn's parents stick to their claim that Dawn's death was accidental, with the evidence Dr. Hinkus has provided and additional information they've gathered, detectives can finally obtain an arrest warrant. Arrived at the house relatively early in the morning. When he knocked on the door, we received no response. Had him knock again, no response. Open up, police. Within about 45 seconds or so, a hysterical female, about 40 years of age, came to the front door. She instantly was uh, hysterically screaming, what have we done to her mother? And we were all confused, not knowing what had happened. And as we entered into the residence, walked down a hallway. We found the stepmother on the ground with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the temple. It appears that she picked up a 25 caliber Beretta and stood at the foot of the bed and shot herself. Stunned, 
the detectives step outside and call Jill DiCarlo. And they told me what had happened. The ambulance hadn't even arrived yet. I just hung up the phone with them and started shaking. And I started crying. I was crying for Don. Once the initial shock wears off, Jill DiCarlo knows she has one more phone call to make to Dr. Madeline Hinkes. I explained to her what had happened, and I think she had some shock on the phone as well, because it's not an ending you expect. I, I've never had anything like that happen to me before. To me, it, it suggested that someone with a, a guilty conscience. With the death of Dawn's stepmother, the Cooper case is finally closed. Dawn's father's not charged with any crime. He still lives in New Mexico. After a 12-week emotional investigation, Dawn's remains are restored at last to their final resting place. Remains were reburied. Uh, her foot bones were reburied in little Ziploc bags labeled left and right. Uh, and she got a, a new casket. For the law enforcement team who spent a year calling up this case from the forgotten files and pursuing justice for a long lost child, their vindication is bittersweet. To a certain extent, there's no closure in that case because we never had the opportunity to confront stepmom with the information. I do think about Don quite a bit and watching my daughter grow, I think about her every time I, I hear about another case that involves child abuse. There's too many cases like that. Coming up, from cremated human remains, can Dr. Dirkmat figure out who this person is? We couldn't get any estimates of the stature of the individual. That's next on Skeleton Stories. Finish your medicine. It's 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and two police detectives of a small Ohio town are performing a strange and chilling task, looking for human remains in a suburban backyard. They're here because last night a young woman, Jennifer Gray, came forward with a terrifying story that seven years ago, her 20-year-old sister Lucy was murdered, and that her body is somewhere in this yard. Lucy was uh, mentally retarded, had the IQ of a six-year-old. Uh, you know, her parents died. Lucy was adopted by this couple uh, when she was like nine years old. According to Jennifer, only a few months after Lucy was adopted, her new father took an interest in her, sexually. For over two years, he molested and sexually assaulted Lucy. But while he attempted to keep his behavior a secret, he didn't succeed. The mother had found out that the father was sexually abusing the victim. And the mother became, of course, quite upset. What had happened was they were getting into a fight on that particular day, and the mother was getting more and more agitated. The father continued his abuse, even against his wife's protests. It was then that Lucy's new mother decided to stop the abuse herself by attempting to kill Lucy. Her weapon was Lucy's own innocent trust. Her mother gave Lucy some concoction the mother had mixed up, which contained uh, some uh, laundry whitening agent and some heart medication and had her drink it. There you go. Drink it up like a good girl. That's a good girl. Doing as she is told, Lucy drinks. But the effort only makes the young girl very sick. She starts getting ill, but she's not dead. She's throwing up and laying on the ground, pretty much almost in a fetal position. For over an hour, Lucy suffers. Don't be nothing but trouble to me, that's all. Then her adoptive father takes matters Don't into his own hands. Don't give me that. Come on, help me. You know, the father's, I guess it said, this is it. And he went out and he started just physically stomping on the victim. Ah. Ah. Stomped her to death, pretty much. 
She was laying on the ground. The, the, according to the witness, she could hear the bones breaking and, and the air being forced out of the victim's body. Then Lucy's parents go to great extremes to try to cover their horrible crime. Taking the body and stacked logs on it and doused it with gasoline and uh, kept the fire going all night long. And then uh, afterwards, the, after the fire died down, they cleaned the pit out and removed all the ashes. And the family never speaks of it again. Now, seven years later, Jennifer can no longer keep the secret. Eventually, this is eating at the sister. It's tearing her apart. It is an incredible and heartbreaking story. But while Detective Tobin is convinced it's true the moment he hears it, he knows other authorities won't be so sure. Jennifer could be lying, and that's a chance that the district attorney doesn't want to take. The district attorney did not want to pursue the case as a homicide because it lacked a body. But police know that in this case, asking for a body may be asking for the impossible. In this particular case, we didn't have a body per se because it had been subjected to this fire of intense heat uh, for, for hours. Oh, yeah, they sat out there and they kept throwing wood on it. Uh, uh, they were tending to it. They were raking it. They were using shovels, breaking up bone. Uh, afterwards, the, after the fire died down, they cleaned the pit out, all the ashes. Lucy's body was burned, pulverized, and hidden. Finding Lucy's remains in such a state would be nothing short of miraculous. And without them, Jennifer's story can't be verified. On their initial search, police come up empty-handed. We didn't have any hopes of finding the body at that point. We didn't know uh, where to look. But Detective Tobin does still have one hope, a scientist who might be able to unearth what he and the other detectives could not. Forensic anthropologist Dr. Dennis Dirkmatt from Mercyhurst College. Our job as forensic anthropologists, it's about paying attention to minute details related to the bones, related to the scene. And that's what we're doing. After the police's failed search, Dr. Dirk Matt arrives, looking for the details they may have missed. In this particular situation, they had a lot of information. They had a very good idea of who was involved and what happened, but they didn't have a body. So the police called us to ask if we could come in and find these remains. The assumption was that they were burned pretty dramatically, that they had been burned over the course of 10 hours. A shovel had been taken to destroy some of the remains and the evidence, and then it was taken out of this fire pit, wheelbarrow, dumped somewhere. But what seems hopeless to police is not hopeless to Dr. Dirkmatt. Even if the remains were cremated and burned and fragmented, there would still be remains, even after 15 years, after 30 years. If the remains were there, we would be able to recover them and maybe get some information as to who this person was. Investigators direct Dr. Dirkmatt to an area where they believe the remains were dumped. His first task is to remove the debris without disturbing any potential evidence. So we set up an archaeological site and then removing the debris layer by layer to see what we had. He painstakingly and methodically sifts through the soil at this site, looking for even the most minute of clues. Over the course of four hours, we completely excavated this area and found no human remains. Okay. Dr. Dirkman is starting to fear that Jennifer's terrifying tale may never reach a jury's ears. But he's not ready to give up yet. We walked about 25 yards away from that original excavation spot. I found a little piece of burnt newspaper. And as we explored a little bit further, we saw that in fact, we had a little burnt debris. So we decided that we should explore this and see if, if this is in fact where the remains were deposited. Dr. Dirk Matt searches the area looking for teeth, tiny fragments of bone, anything that might yield some sort of forensic clue. We weren't finding anything but just little animal bones and stuff like that of you know field mice, chipmunks, whatever. 
but eight grueling hours later, just as he's about to call it a day, Dr. Dirkmet makes a discovery that could be the key to unlocking the case. We found a few bits and pieces of burnt bone. Some of them um, appeared to be animal, but then we found a couple pieces that were, in fact, human. Yeah, they're showing it to me, and I'm like, geez, it looks like a stick. You know, if they didn't have their expertise to tell us what it was, the, the average uh, Joe citizen would never know. It takes Dr. Dirk Matt's expert eyes to determine what tiny pieces are human bone. The remains were shrunk, they were warped, they were fractured, they were fragmented, but in the end, we could identify those as human remains. By the time he's finished, Dr. Dirk Matt and his team have recovered dozens of boxes of what could be human bones. But what bones? and who they belong to are questions that aren't even close to being answered, and they'll need to be if police have any hope of proving that Jennifer is telling the truth. So what we did was then collect all of the remains into boxes and bring it back to the lab, where we could then carefully excavate it. Coming up, even with the bone fragments in hand, the obstacles to making a positive ID seem insurmountable. The fragments were so small and probably had been altered at that fire scene. We couldn't get any estimates of the stature of the individual. Investigators in Ohio believe that Lucy Gray's adoptive parents killed her and then burned her body in an attempt to destroy all evidence of their gruesome crime. To build a case against Lucy's killers, Dr. Dirkmet must first determine what is bone and what isn't among the thousands of fragments he's recovered from Lucy's backyard. It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle when you start out. There's no real pattern to it. Um, you have isolated pieces. So when we're looking at, at these burn bones, they are fragmented, they're misshapen, they're a different color. But there are certain features that you sort of focus upon. It's a visual thing. We know human bones. And so you have to take a look at the pattern and see what do you recognize, what is recognizable to you. So you say, okay, well, this looks like the body of a vertebra. It's sort of a visual conception of what, what these bones look like. A bone like this, it could be actually a piece of wood. And then there is a little test of the sound of it. So here's a piece of wood and has a very different soft sound, whereas this is has a little clinking sound. Over a period of two months, Dr. Dirk Matt combs through tiny pieces of debris, identifying nearly 3,000 fragments as being human bone. But 3,000 fragments still don't add up to a 21-year-old woman. And that's what needs to happen before authorities can be certain that Jennifer's story is true. Incredibly, Dr. Dirkmat will try to use these charred fragments to ID Lucy. He begins by looking for any fragment that could help clarify age, sex, or any other biological identifiers. First, he examines the tooth fragments and roots to see if he can narrow down the person's age. With only minuscule bits and pieces, Dr. Dirkmat faces a colossal challenge. The teeth that we did find were fully developed. So all we could say is that we had an adult. This small finding is Dr. Dirkmat's first foothold. According to Jennifer, Lucy was 21 when she died. Finding adult teeth fits this detail of her story. He moves on, now looking for anything that could tell him whether these remains may have belonged to a male or female. But this is a near impossibility. Determining sex is often done by looking at the pelvis or the skull or the general size of the bones but all Dr. Dirkmat has is splinters. In many cases, when we're looking at fragments of bone, we go on size as, a, as a, an, a hint, at least, as to whether it's a male or female. If it's smaller, it tends to be female, larger male. But again, in this case, you have modification due to heat that, that will reduce the size. So we have to be careful not to attribute 
all of these burned remains to females. He zeroes in on one particular skull feature that forensic anthropologists often use to distinguish males from females, the brow ridge located above the eye socket. From only tiny fragments, Dr. Dirkmat makes another key determination. In the eye orbit, since females don't have large brow ridges, they tend to have sharp margins. In that case, we, we saw an indication of the sharp orbital margins and, and a number of other features that gave us the hint. Dr. Dirkmat knows in this case it is impossible to get a full positive ID from these tiny remains, but he has made a key discovery. These bones belong to a female adult, a perfect match to Lucy's profile. He hopes that this is enough evidence to prove to investigators that this could be Lucy. Dr. Dirk Matt was able to provide us with a report. He was able to analyze those fragments. He was able to determine that they were human. He was able to tell the sex of the individual from some of the fragments. We had spent two months carefully sifting through this material and, and identifying every single fragment. So, very confident of our findings. Dr. Dirk Matt's profile, along with the sister's eyewitness account, are enough to convince the DA to prosecute seven years after the brutal death of Lucy Gray. Murder charges are finally brought against her adoptive parents. I think this turned out pretty well. It gave some closure to the sister, and I think uh, mentally it helped her out a great deal. At her trial, Lucy's mother argues that she is a battered woman who was coerced by her abusive husband. The jury rules in her favor and finds her not guilty. At Lucy's father's trial, investigators turn to Dr. Dirkmat for his testimony. Part of the process is to present to the jury that you know what you're doing, that, that you're an expert in these types of areas, and convincing them that, that you know what you're talking about in terms of um, heat alteration to, to the bones, in terms of how you figure out age and sex and all that and the fact that we were able to uh, get the remains and have them identified by Dr. Dirk Matten, and I think that helped the jurors reach their decision. Jennifer's chilling testimony, along with Dr. Dirk Matt's evidence, leaves no doubt in the minds of the jury. Lucy's father is found guilty of first-degree murder. He gets life in prison without the possibility of parole. For both Dr. Dirk Matt and the investigators, this was one of the more difficult cases of their careers. This was a mentally retarded girl that was a child. It was pretty hard to uh, detach with this one. It was a tragedy that touched everyone involved in the case. And police and Dr. Dirkmat believe that their work helped Lucy's adoptive sister, Jennifer, move on. We were able to find the victim. It gave some closure to the sister. It allows her to feel better about herself. We did do a very careful job. We knew what we were talking about, that we were correct in our assessment and all the bones and determination of age and sex and all that. And so that was proven out by the, the guilty verdict that was handed down. <laughs>